So what makes us unique? What is it that makes us human? Have you ever thought about it? I mean, really sat and thought about it? What makes us special? While we're on the subject, what makes us special in the eyes of each other? I found this article on LiveScience.com. Top 10 things that make humans special. These traits are speech, of course, our upright posture, nakedness. In other words, we look naked compared to primates. Clothing, extraordinary brains, hands with long opposable thumbs so we can bring our thumbs all the way across the hand to our ring and little fingers, giving us the ability to handle and manipulate certain objects. We can build and control fire. We are apparently the only known species with the ability to blush. We have considerably long childhoods where we remain in the care of our parents for years. And this may be linked to the large number of neurons in the neural cortex, which is said to take years to develop. Finally, in this article, they say that most animals reproduce until they die. We, however, live on after our children and even after they have children. These are just examples of some of the things that I want to discuss here, as well as varying physical characteristics of human beings across the world and what contributes to the expression of those traits. Also, I want to talk about something that I'm sure many of you have questioned yourself. What's this obsession with apes? So look, folks, we are not going to go into the debate of evolution versus creation. Science says that we share at least 99.9% .9 of our genes with other humans. Science says that we share at least 96% of those genes with chimpanzees. So that somehow makes them our cousins or evolutionary relatives. But you know what? Science also says that we share 90% of our genes with cats and 85% with mice. Science also says we share 60% of our genes with bananas. Yes, bananas. So now that we have addressed that, let's move on. Probably the most profound distinction between humans and animals is that humans have dominion over them all. We are the only species that can intimately interact with most other creatures on the planet. Yes, animals can cohabitate with other species, but we can raise other species for the most part. I mean, we can reintroduce certain animal species back into different environments. We have animals working for us. We keep them in homes as pets. Even tigers, lions, and bears. What's another potentially dangerous animal other than a lion? How about a crocodile? Yep, people are friends with crocs. How about a hippo? Yep, them too. I got it, a great white shark. Yep, we're friends with them too. We could be friends with Bigfoot if they let us. That's all Bigfoot hunters want to do. They just want to be friends. I think you get the idea. The fact of the matter is that all earthlings have to function in the same environment. That is the true reason we share so much in common with other earthlings. For the brains that we have, these are the bodies that we need to live in this environment. We have been able to establish a pretty solid foundation as to why and how we are very different than other creatures on the planet. But what makes us different from each other? Well, I can tell you, it ain't much. We 
have all come to an understanding that in certain geographical locations, people look a certain way, not with just physical characteristics, but in the way they dress and even behave. But I don't want to get too much into culture here. You see, science does not recognize race in human beings. We typically define race as a population of humans that are categorized based on various inherited characteristics. But in science, different races is the same as subspecies. And human beings have no subspecies unless you are talking about hobbits or Bigfoot. There is only one race, the human race. And the fact of the matter is, compared to other creatures on the planet, we have too much in common to be scientifically divided by race. We are just not different enough. You see, there is what we see, or what we think we see, and then there is reality. The most popular concept is that there are five major races. African, European, Asian, Oceania, and Native American. But the actual genetic variations are in all five. So, in other words, well, let me just explain this. On the chromosome, you have thousands of genes. Some genes come in variations, and these variations are called alleles. So, if you were born with, let's say, dark, coarse hair, you still have the gene or allele, the variation for light, fine hair. Do you see? If you were born with brown eyes, you still have the code for blue eyes. The truth is, if separate racial groups actually existed, we would expect to find alleles and other genetic features that are characteristic of a single group, but not present in any others. Any region-specific gene or allele that is distinctive to that region, only 1% of the people in that region possess that gene. We are diploid organisms, which means we inherit a set of alleles from the father and a set from the mother. Together, the two sets become your genotype on a DNA level. The traits that are expressed from the genotype, hair color, dimples, etc., is your phenotype. Sometimes one parent's allele can block the expression of the other parent's allele. This is where we get into dominant and recessive masking. If your father has blue eyes and your mother has brown eyes and you have brown eyes, you actually have both blue and brown eyes. It is just that the brown eye allele is masking the other. The blue eye gene is still there. And this means that other genes are still there. They are just being masked. Dominant basically means you have it, you express it. Recessive means you don't express it, but you still have it. There are a lot of people who do not have dimples, but they still have the allele for it. How many of you have heard of Achu syndrome? It's a dominant trait when present. It's when someone is suddenly exposed to light after being in the dark for some time and it triggers a sneeze reflex, usually causing the person to sneeze two or three times. Hand clasping, where you clasp your hands together without thinking about it, and if your left thumb covers the right thumb, then that could be the dominant phenotype. And see, Achu syndrome and hand clasping are traits that you can't physically see about the person, right? Just like tongue rolling. Some can roll their tongue, some cannot. But tongue rolling is a dominant phenotype. Early onset myopia, or childhood nearsightedness, is another dominant trait that, again, you can't tell a person carries this trait by looking at them. Now, some of you may or may not have noticed that certain human traits may come with certain abilities that are inherited. Some may not even know they possess these hidden traits. For example, redheads. By the way, when I'm talking about hair color, I'm talking about natural hair color. Anyways, redheads, compared to blondes and brunettes, tend to have a higher tolerance for pain. 
they have a higher tolerance for spicy food and pinpricks, which was discovered by a series of studies involved with injecting subjects with capsaicin, which is almost like injecting someone with hot peppers. Those facial expressions you make, apparently those facial expressions can be inherited. You may think that this is learned behavior, but even people that are born blind or separated from their parents at birth still show the same distinct facial expressions of the parent. Some people may have inherited a gene that interferes with the release of dopamine, which ultimately can determine a person's propensity for physical activity or if they will be lazy. Sweaty hands, insomnia. They have done studies to show that certain behaviors like trusting someone is partly inherited, whereas distrusting someone is strictly learned behavior. The desire to procreate sex, empathy, aggression, bonding can all be attributed in part to inherited genetics. Of course, it would only give you the predisposition for certain behaviors. Even your outlook on life can be partly due to genes that affect receptor hormones like the love and bonding hormone oxytocin, which can contribute to how optimistic or how pessimistic you are. It seems that more than just our genes get passed down to our children, but our personalities as well. And it also seems that information is passed down not only by our genes, but downloaded to the child before the parenting even begins. How many of you have heard of morphic resonance? Well, parapsychologist Alfred Rupert Sheldrake authored a book entitled Morphic Resonance, The Nature of Formative Causation. Listen to this. Morphic Fields in Biology. Over the course of 15 years of research on plant development, I came to the conclusion that for understanding the development of plants, their morphogenesis, genes and gene products are not enough. Morphogenesis also depends on organizing fields. The same arguments apply to the development of animals. Since the 1920s, many developmental biologists have proposed that biological organization depends on fields variously called biological fields, or developmental fields, or positional fields, or morphogenic fields. Okay, stay with me here. Morphogenic fields are not fixed forever, but evolve. The fields of Afghan hounds and poodles have become different from those of their common ancestors, wolves. How are these fields inherited? I propose that that they are transmitted from past members of the species through a kind of non-local resonance called morphic resonance. The fields organizing the activity of the nervous system are likewise inherited through morphic resonance, conveying a collective, instinctive memory. Each individual both draws upon and contributes to the collective memory of the species. This means that new patterns of behavior can spread more rapidly than would otherwise be possible. For example, if rats of a particular breed learn a new trick in Harvard, then rats of that breed should be able to learn the same trick faster all over the world, say in Edinburgh and Melbourne. There is already evidence from laboratory experiments that this actually happens. Now what does this mean for all of us? Well, it may mean that we are more than just individual human beings. It seems as a collective, we can influence each other on opposite sides of the planet. And I guess that could be one of the reasons why now we see madness everywhere. There is more to come, more to receive. Stay tuned. Be sure to visit woodwardentertainment.com and the Woodward Entertainment Store. You can follow me on Instagram at J-A-E Woodward. Until next time, folks, have a great day. And as always, stay awake, stay aware, stay safe. 
and I'll talk to you all soon.